So welcome everyone for this edition of Guadalc. I'm very excited to have uh, Karen here and Auzumali with us. And I'm Claudio, I'm the moderator of this session. I hope everyone enjoys the session. And let's introduce a little bit about uh, the session. We will be talking about introducing principle of, principles of digital autonomy, um, a little bit about the author, Karen. Uh, so Karen Sandler is the executive director of the Software Freedom Conservancy, and before that was the executive director of the Inom Foundation. Karen is shown as a cyborg laureate, and for her advocacy for free software, particularly in relation to the software on medical devices. Karen co-organizes Outreach, the award-winning outreach program for women globally and for people of color who are underrepresented in the US tech. Molly the Bank is interested in the intersection of ethics, society, and technology. She works at the Genome Foundation as a strategic initiatives manager and is a web developer. Welcome to Karen Sandler and Molly the Bank. Thank you for having you here. It's amazing. <laughs> Thanks, Claudia. Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. Um, this is the Principles of Digital Autonomy. It's a project Karen and I have been working on for a while now. Um, and we're here to talk to you, but also like we want it to be fun. We want you to have fun. Um, and if at any point we talk too quickly or we become robots, not, not like cyborg robots, but as in the audio gets weird, um, please ping us and tell us in some capacity. Claudia, feel free to jump in. Um, yes, Claudia, please monitor that and just let us know, um, just jump in and, and stop us so we can we can fix it as best we can sure thing um, if i see anything happening and we'll be pinging you folks on or rocket chat great or just i will start speaking like a lot good um and will be some of these slides uh we tried to make them as accessible as possible some of them might be kind of hard to read um so we're going to do our best to read what they say uh, and in some cases, we'll explain what's going on. On that note, Karen, do you want to explain this slide? Sure, in the corner. So the, this is our title slide. It just says principles of digital autonomy and our names. And then on the bottom right, there is a snorkeling geggle. Um, for those of you who said this is your first water, <laughs> you do not know what a geggle is. I'm not sure anyone does. Um, but uh, the snorkeling geggle, uh, G-E-G-L, will be uh, swimming through our presentation with us. There are a few people well, that know this because uh, because I think the GNOME community is uh, is really fun like this. There are a lot of these little Easter egg type things, and um, and what's fun about them is that uh, anyone who's a newcomer will uh, gets to discover them. And the folks that are here that um, that are uh, have been around for a while have the ability to uh, to introduce other people to them as well. There are a bunch of these silly things. And um, you should never, ever hesitate to ask if you uh, see something you don't know. Because the idea is that if you're here at Guadalc, you're probably, you are in. So these jokes are for you. And if you don't know what they mean yet, you just don't mean what they mean yet. <laughs> okay. uh, let's make a start. So an introduction to myself. Um, I am uh, I'm I'm uh, uh, involved in free and open source software um, for many reasons, but uh, but the thing about me that is uh, it causes me to be passionate about this issue is that I have a heart condition and where I'm at a very high risk of suddenly dying. Otherwise, I'm basically fine, and I have a pacemaker defibrillator. Um, implanted in my body, which basically safeguards in case that happens. And um, I cannot see the source code that is uh, literally screwed into my heart and sewn into my body. And that caused me to be super passionate about this issue. And as I continue to live with my device, I've had all kinds of experiences in my life that make me realize that the ways we interact with technology may not be as they seem on first blush. So for example, when I was uh, pregnant, I, um, I, my heart palpitated, which like a quarter of all pregnant women's hearts palpitate. It's super normal. But um, because I had a pacemaker defibrillator, my device thought that I was in a dangerous rhythm. And so it shocked me unnecessarily because it thought that I needed to be shocked, but really I was just pregnant. Um, and uh, the, um, 
uh, this caused me to realize how um, how there was a real disconnect. So when I think about it, uh, only 15% of these devices go to people under the age of 65. So the number of people who are pregnant with defibrillators is tiny. Um, and it just stands for the proposition that, you know, our technology may not be made with us in mind. Nobody at the device manufacturers want pregnant women getting shocked. It just wasn't like a primary use case because it doesn't happen particularly often. And as we develop our technology, um, we're gonna see more and more of these cases happen. Um, and um, of course, I would be remiss not to acknowledge the fact that the slide says, a Karen is a woman taking advantage of her privilege. And who else but a Karen would ask to see this source code in her defibrillator, right? So uh, also a cyborg lawyer, because uh, as I, I, I have a defibrillator in my body, so that makes me a cyborg, happily. And, um, and I'm a, a lawyer as well as executive director. Sorry, Molly, that was long-winded, now you. <laughs> okay, you'll just talk less later. Um, this is, uh, so this slide has a picture of Molly on them. Uh, Molly is a type of fish. Um, uh, also, I wrote also see totally awesome and I meant to fill that in with something else and I just never got around to it. So I think I'm great. Um, I, I uh, think you're great, which is why I wanted you to keep those, that text unchanged. Okay, good. <laughs> Um, I, so I work for the GNOME Foundation, um, but I'm not here as a representative of the, of the GNOME Foundation. Um, as I mentioned a few minutes ago, this has really been a passion project um, that we've been working on for a while now. Um, and I think it's certainly informed by both of our experiences with our organizations, um, but it's, that's, that's not the extent of it. Um, so you know, I'm a free software activist, a digital rights activist. Um, I kind of got involved because I was basically an activist without a cause. Um, and I had some friends who were really involved in technology and I liked computers, so it kind of matched up. And then eventually, as time went on, I began, began to think about it differently and care about it more um, for a bunch of philosophical reasons, uh, but also because I was thinking about the way technology was impacting my life and the way my rights fit into that whole conversation. Next slide. So why does digital autonomy matter, Karen? Well, Molly, um, you know, digital autonomy matters um, for a variety of reasons. I think we must acknowledge the fact that technology and our relationship to it has really changed a lot in the last um, decade or so. Um, so we now integrate technology into our lives much more intimately. Our um, our devices are deeply connected. It's impossible to interact with the world without interfacing with software and technology overall. Um, when, um, you know, it, 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 it's, it's more than just, um, when we think about our, our technology, it's more than just thinking about software or code. I think the way that we've been thinking about this before, I, when I started thinking about digital autonomy, it was in the context of my heart device. I, I, I realized that, um, so when you have one of these medical devices, they are um, constantly broadcasting. I had to work really, really hard to get the, to find there was only one device on the market that, um, had the ability to disable the radio telemetry, which means to stop it from continuously broadcasting. Every other device manufacturer, um, the wireless was enabled by default and, um, and could not be stopped. And uh, I found this deeply disturbing. Um, having to run outreachy and folks in the GNOME community are, are familiar with um, some of the, um, the negativity that sometimes happens around diversity initiatives. Um, made me realize that I needed to make sure that I wasn't always, <laughs> my device wasn't broadcasting when we know how insecure these devices can be. And so I started thinking about how I really should have a right to not be broadcasting. Like my device shouldn't be, like you shouldn't be able to connect to it at all times. Um, and in the end, I had to get a, de the, a device from uh, a very small manufacturer. Often when I have to get my defibrillator checked, I have to get the device representative to come drive. Um, 45 minutes to my doctor so that he can bring the little thing. Um, and uh, often we have to work to think about what information we're broadcasting and we're not. And when I started thinking about the right not to broadcast, 
I realized that it was much deeper than that. What was it that I was trying to do by trying to prevent myself from unnecessarily broadcasting? And what I realized is that it, it's in fact all about autonomy of my body and my technology, that I, I and we, each of us, need to be in control of how we interface with technology, what information we're sharing, how we're sharing it. Um, and we need to think about these issues holistically. In the past, some of us have been software freedom activists, some of us have been uh, you know, data privacy advocates, but none of those, each of those lenses is really valuable, but they can't operate independently. We have to think holistically about this. And so that's why I started thinking and talking with you about, Molly, about digital autonomy and how do we characterize what this is and why it matters. Yeah. Um. Yeah, I so I was like really interested in getting involved in this conversation, in part because we have a bunch of tools and we have these kind of different disparate movements and different disparate like thinkers and people talking. Um, and they're great tools, but they're only one part of this overarching puzzle of how should technology be with us. Um, and uh, I think that's really necessary when it comes to the fact that we're building products um, and that you're thinking about technology and the concept of building products, when at the same time, we also need to be building a movement. Um, uh, and the movement building is not just around getting people aware of what they're using, but also getting people, like making sure that the things we're building and that the things that other people are building uh, take care of the people using them. So. so it's a time for a declaration of digital autonomy. Um, we're, you know, we've had a very powerful movement in um, the free and open source software world in order to bring software freedom to empower developers and to empower ourselves and our communities um, to create great software and to have independence with respect to our software. Um, but I would say that's not enough now. The, power structure has been tilted so strongly towards the corporations that create the products, devices, and platforms that we interact with. So that now we as the public, we as consumers need to stand up and say, no, these are the principles by which we our technology should be measured. It's not enough that a company comes to market with a useful product or with something that they think that um, you know with with something that um, that we can we can use as a as a useful network. We have to think about the widespread implications of all of these major technologies that we're using, and we have to do it right away. We we can't do it piecemeal, and we can't do it through the lens of all of the movements that we have grown up before. Because now is the time that we need to be coordinated. Now is the time we have to be thinking holistically, and now is the time that we have to put our foot down because we're creating systems that we're going to rely on for a very long time, and we're creating paradigms for creating services and products that we're going to incorporate into the most intimate aspects of our lives, even more so than we already are doing, which is very substantial. Mm -hmm. Um, so the principles of digital autonomy is, it's a framework. Um, so I don't want, so I want people to go into this thinking that this is a way we can analyze technology, which is what we'll be doing. We'll be analyzing GNOME, uh, in this context. Um, but that you can look at any given piece of technology within this framework. Um, and that hopefully you'll be inspired to, apply it when you're creating things as well. Um, or when you're using things or just talking to people about things, you know, we want you to really come out of this just with a new way of thinking. And the principles of digital autonomy is a work in progress. It comes out of conversations between um, Molly and myself. And, you know, every time that we revisit this, we think of additional facets. Um, this is something that is going to evolve not just as we think further about it but as our technology changes in the um, in the the years to come this is not something that we are gonna just be able to articulate and move on from this is something that we need to deeply engage with continue to re-examine and um, and push forward as best we can so that we can empower ourselves to demand the technology that we deserve the ethical technology that we can rely on safely um, and to kind of add something to that, not kind of, but to add something to that, um, 
uh, Karen said this is based on conversations we've had, but it's it's nearly impossible to clear like to add everyone who has participated in these conversations with us. Um, I think a lot of this comes from not just our combined what like thirty years of software or something ridiculous like that, but um, like the the times we've had leading up to that point, our experiences with technology, our experience with ethics. Um, and also because it's a work in progress, uh, we really want feedback um, and we want your ideas and your criticisms and we'll be posting like, an, you know, we have an actual text um, with all of these laid out and we'll be posting that soon uh, for reading and commenting on um, as well. Yeah, I want to echo what Molly said. And there are several people whose names I see in the um, who are potentially watching or listening here who have also shaped my thinking even from the very beginning of when I started getting involved in free software. Yeah. Um, so Wanda says that you are confused, but this is your normal state. Wanda is an Easter egg um, from old school GNOME days for newcomers. And it's a, it's a fun, silly GNOME thing. So she'll just appear occasionally in this talk for fun. Um, so some background, really what's going to happen right now is we're going to define some terms so you understand what we're talking about. And so we're all on the same page when we're discussing things because we're using lots of terms that come from science and engineering and philosophy and several other fields. Um, so I want to start by talking about autonomy. Um, so when we talk about autonomy, we're usually talking about personal autonomy though we also mean collective autonomy. So the basic premise, and you can read more about this, um, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy is like a really good place to get a quick summary, quick. Um, uh, and it's, you know, the basic idea is that we are self-governing actors. So we have the ability to make decisions. Um, and, and when we talk about it, we're also taking this idea that we have the right to make decisions and we have the right to be in control of our physical space, but also our, our psychic ones, so our intellectual and our emotional. Um, and that, that is not just a thing that we ought to be able to do, but that, that that is a thing that we have the right to do simply because we exist. When we talk about digital, it's just as it sounds, we mean anything that um, that about that is about us that comes from interacting with technology. Um, that means that it's any information about us or any way that we're vulnerable from having information about us or interactions online or in any other aspect of cyberspace. Um, and it concerns any information about us that remains um, behind and is transferred to third parties and um, and and lives on where, wherever it may live. And digital autonomy is really the idea that we control our own destinies in this regard, that we should have autonomy with respect to that digital component of our identity that remains um, on any server, anywhere, in any form, on any device, that we should have some degree of autonomy over what happens with that, that we are in control um, because it is, it is, we have a right to it. And so digital autonomy stands for that whole idea that uh, that we should step up and demand that we have an adequate amount of control over what happens with not just our interactions and how that happens, but also what remains behind and what anyone can do with our data or anything else related to it. Um, so rights, uh, rights are these unalienable things, right? They're, they, the idea is that we shouldn't, you don't need to justify why you deserve a right. It is something that you simply deserve. It is a respect, it is a set of freedom. It, it freedoms, it is uh, things to which you are entitled simply because you exist. Um, and we just get those, or we should. Technology. As a cyborg, I think a lot about technology. Um, I joke about being a cyborg. It's funny. I was really, to be totally honest, super panicked about needing a defibrillator um, when that happened. And uh, I was not cool about it at all. And I wasn't cool about my own mortality. And I wasn't cool about getting some device 
sewn into my body. Really not cool about that. And then I had this realization of like, but wait, I get to be a cyborg. And that made me super happy about it. And it really just sort of changed the way that I, I think about it. And over the, con the course of time of evaluating, like what makes me a cyborg and what is a cyborg and what isn't a cyborg, um, I've had a lot of conversations with people and thought about it. Um, one thing that, um, that I often uh, like to point out or discuss with people is that some people, you know, to some extent, um, glasses are technology. And so we are constantly in the process of becoming and unbecoming cyborgs because we, we can put on our glasses and take off our glasses. And so, um, you know, I think that when we talk about technology, we really need to be loose about what that means. And it's in part because every single thing that we have is becoming connected and is becoming digital. So for example, it is very common to have connected toothbrushes where you basically are subscribed to a, a, a you know, there's a subscription model where you, uh, you get sent new toothbrush heads when your toothbrushes run out. And I've seen versions of those toothbrushes that have cameras on them to assess how well you are brushing your teeth to give you helpful tips. But suddenly you have a toothbrush which has technology integrated into it. And so anything that has um, any degree of connectivity or software or um, anything else related to that, we consider technology. Um, and this is really important because of the pervasiveness of technology that we're interacting with, um, but also, uh, you know, the idea of our rights extends beyond just software, right? It extends to the hardware, it extends to, like, the fiddly bits that make it work. It extends to your toothbrush. Um, and we're also going to talk about things like privacy and data rights. Um, and those are all technology too. Um, so uh, user, user is a term that we throw around a lot, um, both here and in general in free software. Um, I don't love the term user because it kind of pushes someone off to the side as like a thing being interacted with rather than an active participant. Um, but so what we mean when we say user in this case is anyone interacting with a technology, whether you know it or not. Um, so you're a user of a uh, like of a monitoring system when like there are cameras doing speed checks on the highways. Um, the term user sounds very um, it's very dismissive. It sounds like a person who is the user is someone who is taking advantage of something someone else has done. But I think uh, we must acknowledge that users uh, so often become contributors or have the potential to become contributors. And in a, w a world where we have true digital autonomy, the line between users and, um, and creators of technology is very, very thin. And so uh, if, if anyone is thinking of feedback, if there are other ways of thinking about, um, of talking about users than we've traditionally done in the software freedom movement, um, we'd definitely be willing to hear about it because um, I think like Gnome has been really good about, um, well, maybe we should talk about this later, yeah, focusing we'll on users, but, but couching it in the, ter like with the vocabulary of user can be alienating. And so we wanna specifically say how broad it is that we mean user to be. So Wanda says, bank error in your favor, collect $200. Wanda wants us to move on. Uh, so the first principle of digital autonomy, it's in service to the people who use it. Um, this is a little bit of a catch-all uh, and it encompasses a lot of different things um, really based around the idea that uh, tech, like a piece of technology and using it isn't about the company that designed it, or it shouldn't be, and it shouldn't be about um, the like the people funding it, and it shouldn't be about all these other things. It should be about the people who are actually using it um, and taking care of them and making sure that they have the things they need and that their rights are the ones being respected. So, so good now. Yeah, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna tell you these principles that we've tried to distill out of all of the um, the, the reasons that the, 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 the components of digital autonomy. And as with any, um, any kind of um, a framework, the proof is in the pudding. Like how does it, how does that work out when you think about some real world technology? And now 
when we first started putting um, some of this down on paper, Molly and I were thinking about really um, a lot of predatory technology. We were thinking about um, technology that is very intrusive and that people use without thinking about it, but is exploitative in nature. Um, personal fitness trackers and uh, proprietary video chat that includes a surveillance component. And so we tried to articulate the principles that we thought we needed to be free of those problematic components of that technology. And then in order to determine whether or not we had really thought of everything correctly, we decided why not think about GNOME in that light, right? Like let's look at these principles that we think we need in order to have digital autonomy and see whether how GNOME stacks up. So um, on this first principle um, uh, about um, about GNOME, you know, um, in service to the people who use it, GNOME is people, as the uh, as the tagline says. Um, you know, GNOME basically comes out of a community, and it um, you know it it has good features and interoperability. You can, um, you know, opt in and, and opt out of various reporting. You have a lot of options um, with respect to GNOME. And obviously, we're fans of GNOME. Well, Molly's now an employee of the foundation, but I'm, I, I used to be an employee of the foundation. Now I'm just a fan and contributor when I can, but that's not as much as I would like. Anyway, so pretty great. Yeah. Well, we wouldn't be able to do analysis if we didn't also look at the not the less good, the deltas, right? The less good side to something. Um, and we, uh, it wasn't always easy actually to come up with a criticism. Um, but so one of the things that I was thinking about in terms of things being in service was uh, accessibility, right? So we need to make sure that a technology works for everyone. If it doesn't work for everyone, it just doesn't work. Um, so uh, if you saw Emanuele's talk earlier, you'll know that we're doing a lot of work on accessibility. We're trying really hard, um, but there are still a lot of parts to it that need a lot of work. Um, and as a shameless plug, that's a way you can get involved by like contributing and hanging out with the Gnomies and participating. Um, yeah, and I would add on accessibility that like uh, when I was, what like I was at the first, Guadac after um, GNOME 3 came out and the accessibility team put up a slide and it was simply a picture of stairs um, because accessibility was so bad in the first iteration of GNOME 3 that basically all the great work that had been done in GNOME 2 had had was no longer valid and they had to start from scratch again and they've been working all this time and making great improvements and so i just want to acknowledge that and how powerful of a statement that the i think that was uh, pinero and um and joe marie I, that was really like a great poignant way to uh to um to describe the situation and so much work has been done since then yeah um the other thing is that gnome is a big project it has a lot of moving parts um because it's so comprehensive uh so user requests get lost in this dynamic um, and also deciding between what is always easy. Um, so there are some more ways that things could better address the needs of the people who are interacting or using uh, GNOME. Next slide. Me. Wanda says, this is the day upon which we are reminded of what we are on the other 164, Mark Twain. I don't, I, we're not gonna analyze that right now. We have like less than 20 minutes left. We, we well, we, right. We, we are, as our digital autonomy helps us be. <laughs> um, so this, this slide says principle two informed consent. Um, uh, and I've been thinking about consent a lot because to bring it back to my experience with my heart device, could I really consent properly to get my device? So we talk a lot about being able to understand the um, the technology that you're agreeing to use and how it, like how the things that you agree to play out over time. And what we mean in this principle is is actually like practical informed consent, real consent. So for example, um, when I got my defibrillator, the choice was really, 
do you want this life-saving device or not? Like the question is often boiled into like, do you want this life-saving device? Oh, which by the way is consistently broadcasting information about yourself and is vulnerable and has all of these other problematic aspects to it, but there's no alternative. Informed consent has some component of, you know, it's a real consent because you actually have choices. Um, and uh, and that's not, not always the case. So, um, uh, you know, we need to have, we need to be able to understand what it is that we're agreeing to and not just have this default consent. And with so many aspects of our technology, we have terms and conditions that no one could read. Um, there was a study that showed that you would have to do nothing else for months and months, but read terms and conditions in order to read all of the terms and conditions that the average person agrees to. It's not practical and it doesn't work. Um, so we need to have understandable consent that, um, that we can um, we can agree and we need to be able to not sacrifice our autonomy. Mm -hmm. And understandable, I think, is a really key word there. And that's what informed means in this context. Um, if you don't know what you're agreeing to, you can't agree to it. Um, so to look at GNOME in that content, like to look at GNOME from that, you know, GNOME is free, so free and open source software. Um, and at the top, like the top level, of technology being something that we can consent to from a place of information, from a place of understanding, is that we have to be able to examine and audit and look at every part of it. Um, so when something is proprietary, when something is closed source, when we can't look at how it works, we fundamentally just cannot understand it. We don't have that option or that ability. Um, so, you know, that's a great starting point for GNOME um, because we can look at it and we can try to understand it. Um, it's worth noting real quick that, you know, we picked one or two examples for each of these, but there are a lot more parts to it. Claudio, hey, say hey. something? Yes, I don't want to interrupt what you're saying because it's very interesting, but we are running out of time. We have only 10 minutes left. Um, so feel free if you want to jump straight to the questions or if you just want to continue talking because it's very interesting to be honest. We'll, uh, we'll go we'll more quickly, that. which yeah, means we'll, we'll, we'll tell okay. slightly fewer personal anecdotes. Sure. That's going to be tough. <laughs> I know. But <laughs> freedom, but software freedom is essential in order for understanding technology, right? Being able to see. Um, the source code is a really important component of it, but that's not necessarily sufficient. Um, you know, in in many cases, it's very difficult to understand the source code um, just by looking at it, especially depending on what your technical level is. And on top of that, um, you know, in instances of like, you know, of machine learning and AI, the ability for a human to understand the code, you know, is is uh, not necessarily, uh, you know, it, it, it might be impossible anyway. So this is you, Karen. Uh, w Wanda says that, uh, is everything working? Go a little faster, that's a relief. He doesn't say go a little faster. Oh, he just... doesn't say go a little faster, okay. <laughs> uh, it's worth noting that May 24th is my birthday, so I feel like this was a birthday present for me. Nice. <laughs> um, on the next slide, uh, we have principle three, which is empowering individual and collective action. Um, we think it's really important, I mentioned in autonomy, bring, going back to that, is that this isn't just about you as an individual person, but this is about our communities and the things that we create together and the things that we work on together. Um, this includes stuff like having options within a technology to make sure that it works for everyone within your community, having control of the data, um, having uh, choices and autonomy around like, who's owning the devices, who's owning the technology. So in the case of software, it's like, is your community, does your community at least have the opportunity to say run its own server? Like, that's an important question. Um, and so if we look at GNOME, there are um, things in the positive 
uh, aisle, no CLA. The GNOME community has roundly rejected um, CLAs. There's some exist in the margins of the community, but uh, but it, CLAs tend to tip the balance of power towards single entities. And if that's not a charity, then that can be a real problem. Uh, the GNOME Foundation, I this slide hasn't come up yet for me, but um, uh, the GNOME Foundation is pretty is is great because it's a it's a, a body that empowers its members to take action on behalf of the um, the project, which is really important. Um, it has corporate corporate involvement as at the advisory board level, which provides corporate input but no control, um, which is great for empowering individuals. Um, I would say that the awkwardness about the GNOME Foundation is the separation between the technical direction of GNOME and the foundation. I think that that is blurred in um, even from when I was executive director, but that's sort of by design. Um, and and there are you know there are are good things and bad things about it. Um, but um, but I would say like overall, it's a it's a it's great that there is the GNOME Foundation, and the fact that it, it exists and is a charity is great for the um, the stances that GNOME will take for digital autonomy. Um, one of the other things uh, about GNOME is there are lots of options both within the software, but also for desktop environments. Right, I've tried a bunch of them myself. Um, so it's 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 you're not locked into it, right? If you want to consent enthusiastically to it, if you want it to be a thing that works for the community, uh, you can make that choice, but you don't have to, and that's okay. But you should use it because it's awesome if, if you want <laughs> totally. to. Totally. Because what else would you use? Um, GNOME doesn't make a land grab for anybody's data, and it doesn't rely on centralized services. So thumbs up. Trying to be pity. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, and it works offline, right? With a lot of devices these days in general, um, you have to have some sort of connection, like for your toothbrush maybe. Um, and so being able to use something without uh, having a connection to the internet means that it works when, whenever you need it. Uh, this was just built on what Karen was saying earlier about technical mm -hmm. direction and the relationship between the community and the foundation and who's making decisions. Uh, oh, yeah. sorry, this is your slide. Yeah, no, that's right. It's not necessarily um, an an organized. You know, I, I think often it, it the, often GNOME makes uh, makes progress because individuals individuals are scratching their own itch, or a corporation has something they're trying to accomplish with GNOME and. Uh, and less about the collective action of, um, of contributors, although that does also happen in GNOME. So it sort of depends, you know, what what the initiative is about and, um, and being cognizant of that tension is, I think, really important. Uh, you know, and on the downsides, one of the things that needs to work is security. Um, there are plenty of old security bugs. So if you want to work on those, you should totally get involved and work on those and help make GNOME security better. Uh, security and privacy issues are huge, especially for communities and individuals who want to do anything really, because you can't create ideas in a space that is insecure. Um, Melinda says, you've been leading a dog's life. Stay off the furniture. I love that one. <laughs> So our principle four is to protect citizens' privacy and other rights by design. Um, and this means that uh, that we're gathering and recording the minimum amount of data needed to provide services. This means that we're thinking about not keeping data when it's not essential. So basically making all designs with privacy at the forefront from the beginning. Um, so to talk about GNOME at that, in that context, um, it has some pretty nice data policies uh, overall. Um, one of the quotes I like from the privacy policy is, unless you consent, the foundation will never process or share the personal data you provide us except as described below. Uh, and then there's a brief description, which is very respectful um, to the people using it and comes down to as long as it works, as long as it's necessary to work with GNOME services uh, and nothing else. Um, Quick personal anecdote, which is once we started this project, I started reading a lot more privacy policies. <laughs> so, boop. yeah, and 
regular deletion of inessential data should always be planned from the outset. Um, and I think that uh, looking at GNOME's privacy policy, I see it comes from a great organization, Software Freedom Conservancy. <laughs> uh, uh, it, the policy only contemplates deleting data when requested. Um, I'm not sure what GNOME's policies are for regular um, rolling deletions of data, but, uh, but it's, it should be something that's considered by everyone. Don't keep any more than we absolutely need. Wanda the fish says, excellent day for putting slinkies in an escalator. And that's it. That's that's the talk. Can um, we still have some questions? Yeah. According to my clock, we have time. I don't know if that's true. Well, Claudio yeah, is five minutes. Powerful, so. <laughs> cool. And it was an, a great talk. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Questions. So uh, for the audience, you can start typing the questions on the Reddit track to channel on our rocket chat. Feel free to uh, make questions. Um, there will be a pasted. Okay, we already have questions. Great. <laughs> so let me paste them quickly. <laughs> Wait. So will you read them, Claudio? Um, yeah, I can do that, but there is also an uh, Etherpad available for both of you if you want to give a check. It's in the shared oh, notes shared of the notes? channel. Yeah. yeah, but if you if you want, oh, sure. Yeah, could you, could you read some? That would be best. Great. Uh, first question. There are some interesting discourse that being an open source or for freedom software is not enough for users. They do not achieve liberation by just having the source code. They get closer to liberation by having a supportive user community and supportive developers, even if it's closed source. I'm Red sorry, I'm gonna automatically code. interrupt real quick. Is is this a question or is this a comment? This is a question. The question is in the very, very end. Uh, okay. Guadoc has practically all developers and very few users. How do we fix this? Is the question, how do we fix who's here in the conversation? Um, which yeah, I guess the you can't. Wait, the, sorry, the you in Guadoc is supposed to be users, but I think Guadoc has never done an awesome job of having tons of users around. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that having this, uh, can, you, can anybody raise their hand if they use GNOME but um, are not a developer? Mm -hmm. I'd be curious to see that. I think that this format might be better than any yeah. that we've done before. I see a few hands. Yeah. Um, I actually think the conference Vodic has, has done something great this year, um, which is having a lot more talks that are relevant to technology, relevant to open source, but just like relevant to being an interested person in the world, um, which allows more people to kind of show up and get involved and like learn things. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I think this is a problem that GNOME has had in the past. Like, I think GNOME has been given an unfair rap on like being accused of not listening to users and that users bring problems and the GNOME community ignores them. And I think some of that was like calculated marketing by detractors, honestly. But at the same time, there really is something to it, which is that it's hard to figure out ways that you can engage with a user base. You can't do everything that everybody wants. You can't please everyone all of the time. You have to make tough choices. But at the same time, there has to be ways for users to engage with the conversation about how their technology is developed and and, and how it, it, it is carried on from there. I think. Gnome is really good about this because there are so many ways you can get involved if you're non-technical. Uh, is there another question? Yes, explain the giggle. <laughs> How about we don't do that right now in case there's a question? Just, just look it up, look up giggle. It's a mascot, I'll say that. Okay. Uh, um, we're also not going to talk about the Swedish conspiracy. I just wanna say that right now. <laughs> okay, next question then. Are these principles published anywhere currently? Uh, we have a document. What you can do is you can email us at one of these email addresses and we will send it to you. And maybe, not maybe, definitely uh, between now and I guess a week from now, we'll have a web page up with some information. Most likely, on yeah. We need to get that done. Coming soon. Okay. 
next question. What are the next steps for these principles in your opinion? <laughs> <laughs> Why are you laughing? No, Molly, don't laugh. Don't laugh. You, you're, you're laughing. Like, we, we know exactly what our next steps are. Our next step. So our first step is to articulate them and to publish them and to get feedback on them and to refine them. And in doing so, we're going to analyze various pieces of technology so that we can understand how these principles interact with our, you know, with all of our different kinds of technology. And then we'll look at that and we'll take it um, from there, um, mm -hmm. both as a tool to criticize technology that's happening and as a framework for people to use when they're developing new technology. It can then be used as educational information when uh, it comes time for regulations and other kinds of um, legal initiatives. Um, and then on top of that, there's a component of ethical analysis that we expect that will sort of permeate um, into other fields. How's that, Molly? Was that convincing? No, it's great. I I jumped past the, I jumped to the like, what do you do after they're written and finalized part? And I'm like, I hadn't thought at all about that part. <laughs> I just thought about the writing and analyzing part. Um, so as part of this process, uh, one of the things we did to feel good about the principles is we did analysis of several technologies in addition to GNOME. Um, and I, I don't know how Karen feels, but I don't mind sharing them. We have one on Zoom and one on Fitbit. Um, uh, we actually have two on Fitbit uh, from slightly different angles. Um, uh, and there are a few more in the works. So there, there's also analysis to think about. Do we have time for one more question? Yes, just two one question let me just quickly check what question here could be explained more quickly um <laughs> i'm glad uh, there are a lot of questions yeah i don't want to be selective um but okay um so uh, these two next questions they probably would require long answers um uh is gnome well positioned to advance any specific principle you covered i'm sorry Did you the question was, uh, is GNOME well positioned to advance any specific principle you covered? Yes, quite um, a few of them. GNOME yeah. does very well on most of our principles, on, on all of them. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, there are, there are areas for improvement. But I, I think that as a software freedom project that is uh, run by a diverse group of people from different places that are motivated as individuals and corporate involvement. Um, I think it is very well positioned to demonstrate most of our principles, all, all of our principles. Um, to, to give two very specific examples, um, I do think that there's a lot of security and accessibility work uh, that has happened, but there's still a lot still to be done um, and that those are like some concrete things. Um, another thing is working on making the technology more understandable um, so that more people can approach, can try to process, I'm trying to not say understand again, uh, so that more people can understand it uh, and then consent from a place of better information. Okay. Folks, um, sorry, we are really out of time. I see that we have more questions. For everyone that's attending, feel free to join us in the graduate track too. I'm sure that Molly will be there. I hope, Karen, you are also there to answer more questions and engage with us in Rocket Chat. Thank you very much for both of you. It was a very intriguing and exciting talk, in my opinion. And uh, everyone, have an amazing whatever your time zone is right now. And Congratulations for the talk, really. Yay, Karen. Yay, Molly. <laughs>